Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Jo, uh, Jo Pullin, and I work on the project called the Conservation Communities Project. And you can see on the screen now, hopefully, um, a little bit about the project. So it's got a very small area of Devon that it covers, just 11 parishes from Great Torrington to Haverley. And we've been, for, in, we've been fortunate enough to host this project for a year now. We've got a year left on the project. And we're going to be working with communities from across these 11 parishes to try and record as much about wildlife as we can and to try and increase the number of species records at the Devon Biodiversity Records Centre. And so we're working closely with the Records Centre and that's why we have Jess here this evening and we're going to talk to you about how you can help us increase the records across the county. So this project's been funded by the lottery and we're fortunate enough to, to have this funding for this period of the project. And we're hoping that the whole of Devon will benefit from some of the things we're doing, like tonight's talk, um, and increase the records across the county. But the focus is primarily for my time to be spent on these 11 parishes. So if you can help us um, up our records, we'd be really, really grateful. Devon Biodiversity Records Centre has got a very straightforward recording form, um, and you can um, put any of your wildlife sightings on there. Obviously this evening we're going to be talking a lot about hedgerows and hedgerow surveys, so we're, we're quite specific tonight on our theme, but I just wanted to let you know you can record all wildlife across the county um, and that would be of great help. Um, anyone in my project area can borrow one of the trail cameras that we've got, um, and obviously if you want to find out more about the project then if you go on to Devon Wildlife Trust's website and look up conservation communities you'll be able to find all the links of previous talks that we've done on various themes from mammals through to other hedgerow talks, um, barn owls and all sorts of things. So you'll be able to um, you'll be able to uh, you'll be able to have a look at those on on the website. So if you've got any um, comments this evening or any questions, if you could put them in the live chat, um, we'll get to those at the end once Jess has finished her, her talk. Um, and we'll have an open sort of discussion at the end um, and feedback before we finish the session. So I'm just going to um, unshare my screen. I'm going to pass you over to Jess and to say hi Jess, thank you for coming along this evening and to talk to us about hedges. I'm going to put myself on mute so I don't disturb you. Thanks Jess. <laughs> Thanks Jo, um, hopefully everyone can see my first slide there. Um, yeah, thank you very much for all, well not coming out, for staying in on this uh, very wet and windy evening um, to come and hear about hedges. And I'm in particular going to be talking about a survey um, that we're running within the conservation communities area. Although I know there are a few people who are joining us this evening from outside the area. And if you want to take part in the hedgerow survey, um, please do get in touch because um, although we're trialing it within the conservation communities area, we do need data on hedgerows from um, well across Devon. So uh, do let me know. So as Joe said, um, the conservation communities project is working um, with the communities within uh, the project area. Uh, and we've been going for a little while now uh, and funded by the lottery. Here's the map. Um, so you can just about see the coast up there uh, for anyone who's not familiar with this area. Um, all the way from Great Torrington up here, 11 parishes down to Hadley, and we've got Oakhampton somewhere just off the map. So hedgerows can be a host of such amazing um, diversity of wildlife. So we've got some real sort of classic hedgerow creatures, so um, dormice, which are really quite quite scarce, although we're very lucky in Devon to have a, a bit of a stronghold, but they, they really need hedges, um, like so many of our um, mammals, birds, invertebrates, everything really, to be able to move through the landscape from, from one patch of woodland to another, or just simply to live, live in the hedgerow and um, gain all their food and shelter and everything from there. Um, they're home to um, various plants, lichens, got a lovely cladonia here that was at the base of a hedgerow. Um, birds and mammals using, their, um, using the, the shelter of a hedge to create nests. And down here in this one, this is actually a brown hair streak egg. 
And brown hair streaks are a type of butterfly that uh, are quite rare and they're um, sort of patchily distributed. Um, but we've got quite a few areas within Devon where we can find them, including within the conservation communities area. Um, so although there's very low numbers, um, we, we do have them there and they, they live on blackthorn hedges, of which we have you know, some fantastic blackthorn hedges in Devon. And then uh, they're also just, I put this in because I just love spindle and I think it's so beautiful. And this was taken in December. So throughout the year, you can get some beautiful color in hedges. So as well as being fantastic for wildlife, they're also um, well, beautiful, I think. And as well as for wildlife, hedgerows can provide um, lots of other benefits. So they can be really good to help protect against flooding, for example. Um, lots of rain falling on fields, hedgerows provide a barrier to stop soil erosion. Um, their um, trees and plants within the hedgerow um, help to sort of store carbon as well. So there's so many different benefits for hedgerows. And we are asking you to come and help us survey them. Um, so a little bit about the, the survey. Um, we are starting, as I said, the pilot in the, the conservation communities area. And the, the, the thing we have is that we just, we just need a bit more information. And we have so many hedgerows in Devon, it's amazing. Um, we have some of the, 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 I think we might be the county with the most, the most hedgerows. So 33,000 miles, the Devon Hedge Group has worked out of hedgerow just within Devon. And to um, put that into uh, some sort of, so, so you can see how long that is. I, I, I had a look at, so 53,000 kilometers. I worked out the distance um, around the equator is 40,000 kilometers. So you could take all of our hedgerows and go around the world more than once. Um, and within these hedgerows, they're also particularly special. So over three quarters of our um, hedge banks so those are not, not just sort of hedges that are, are flat on the ground, but ones that are built up on a bank, are thought to be um, at least from sort of medieval origin. So that's going back to the sort of between 1100s and, and 1400s. Um, and so that's from uh, Devon County Council source. And even ones on Dartmoor um, from the same source can be over 4,000 years old. So, you know, hedges are, They've been here for such a long time and they are so important that, you know, all these animals and plants really, really rely on them. And it's that connectivity that they, they offer between our areas of woodland as well. So also in Devon, we're lucky that um, a lot of our hedges are really good quality. And we have 20% of all the species rich hedges in England. So species rich means that it's not just made of one, one type of tree. Um, it's, it's got a, a really good variety, often sort of seven or eight different species or even more that you can find within the hedge. So why do we need your help? Um, here at DBRC, we have a, a layer on our map of hedgerows. Um, they've been assembled from aerial photographs and some sort of very clever, um, Sort of systems that they've got for doing that. So we know where the hedges are and there's a few things that we can tell from our data but we really don't have very much information beyond sort of where they are and maybe roughly their size. So for example what species of different trees make up the hedge? Is there a ditch or a bank or, or some other feature of the hedge? Um, what's their management like? These are things that we just we just don't know from, um, from the, the data that we have and we are hoping that um, you can help us answer these questions by going out to um, hedgerows that you have access to. So we're looking at hedgerows along public footpaths um, or on um, land that you, you have access to. Maybe it's your own land. You've got explicit permission from, from the landowner um, to go in and survey them. So we've got a few things that we're asking in particular. So what I'm gonna do this evening is I'm going to go through our survey form and as we go through, just sort of thinking about all the different aspects of a hedge and what can make a hedge really special. So here's the start of the form. Um, so I'll go through the top bit. Obviously, we need to know who you are, 
um, where the hedge is that you are surveying, um, when, and then the start and end point of your survey. So we're looking um, ideally at a grid reference, but if you are more comfortable with using what three words, then, then do go ahead and do that. Um, and how long your hedgerow is approximately, um, just as you're sort of pacing it or, or you can look at it on a map. And then we are going to ask you about the hedge structure. Now the hedge structure is, I've got a, a little flow chart here, which looks a little bit complicated at first glance, but I'm hoping that we can go through it um, together this evening and um, really sort of look at the different types of management of hedgerow. And then at the end, we'll talk about um, a little bit of, of hedgerow management um, so that we can sort of make, make the most of our hedges. So looking at the, this first section here, the green section, this is probably the easiest one. So we're looking at, has it been recently planted? That's in the last five years. Um, has it been laid or coppiced? Or is it actually completely the other end of the scale and it's so old that there's hardly a hedge there anymore, just a line of trees? So here are some examples. So this, um, I visited a friend last week and she has a fantastic hedge just opposite her house that's recently been laid. Now, hedge laying is a really sort of ancient way of managing hedges and it's fantastic. So as you can see here, um, the, the stems are cut, but not all the way through, just enough that they can be bent down and help them sort of really thicken the hedge. And then from those branches, more will grow up and that keeps the hedge lovely and dense. And if a hedge is nice and dense, it creates a fantastic habitat um, and shelter for all the mammals and the birds and invertebrates that, that obviously we hope will live there. So that's a, a very recently laid hedge. Here we've got a very recently planted hedge. So you can see here they've built a little bank as well. Um, so it'll start growing on, on the bank, which is a really, really classic Devon hedge. I think we've all seen those as you, so even the ones as you drive around on the road, you know that the bank is often actually taller than, than your car. And then the hedge just sits on top of that. But this is how, how they start. So I think those ones are quite easy to, to identify. Um, here we've got a couple, well, a few that have Gone, gone beyond. So these are some probably very, very old hedges where actually most of the area has grown up into a woodland. So you can see remnants of, of the bank that it was on and this line of trees. Um, here there's some fantastic old um, beaches that have grown along here. And you can, you can usually tell when there's lots of beaches around because there's still some fantastic leaves on the ground. And I only took these ones last week. And here another one that was very definitely a hedge. So this is a little bit um, younger than these ones. Um, still got quite a lot of the, the growth up here, but it's very definitely a line of trees rather than a hedge. So these, although they're still, um, obviously they offer a lot, those big trees are really holding on to lots of carbon. They've got the bank, they'll still help with um, soil erosion and having those thick roots but they might not be quite as good as at offering shelter as um, some of our sort of lower, denser hedges. So another section, this is looking at hedges that are really heavily flailed or trimmed. Now, I don't mean just going out with a hedge trimmer and just cutting off sort of a, a, a year or so of growth. I mean, sort of when, when they look like this, when someone's gone out with a flail and, and really really taken a lot off the hedge. And these you start to get um, sort of gnarly um, sections of the hedge where it's obviously cut down to the same height again and again and again. Um, here's another one with, with that's getting a bit gappy. And here you can see these are generally referred to as knuckles. So it's, it's really kind of, if you imagine where the sort of the twigs are coming off off the branch here, it's these sort of knuckly bits um, that form when a hedge has been flailed again and again and again. And a lot of the hedges at the moment look like this, um, particularly along roads where they're flailed very regularly. 
here's another one that you can see it's it's actually very um, sparse at the base of the hedge and then and then cut at the top so these are all very heavily managed and this is a really classic scene isn't it in in Devon these um, beautifully trimmed square hedges this one's fantastic it's about as wide as the road is um, here but that's a, a hedge that I think we've all seen one just like that so these are the hedgerows that are really heavily managed and then from that we'll have a there's a breakdown of whether they've got um, sort of gaps in them as well. But this is what I mean by really heavily managed rather than just a little bit trimmed. So this you can see, although it's heavily flailed, it's still, you know, that's, that's a fantastic dense hedgerow underneath. So if the hedgerow here, it's not really regularly heavily flailed. And remember that heavily flailed or trimmed is where you get sort of the, the knuckles and, and things forming. So it might be managed, but it might be managed a little bit more sympathetically. So it's still the shape of a hedge. It might have been recently trimmed, but that doesn't mean that it's trimmed um, drastically sort of on a, on a yearly basis. Um, maybe not trimmed for a couple of years and starting to get a bit straggly and not trimmed for a long time, although it's still dense and, and thick and, and has obviously been managed, although it's getting really, really rather tall. So we've got a couple of examples here. Um, these are taken in the summer, as opposed to most of my photos that are taken over winter, I'm afraid. Um, so you can see it's, it's still definitely a hedge, but it's really lovely and thick and bushy. And that's probably one that is trimmed um, less regularly and less heavily than the ones we saw in the photos earlier. And same with this one here. It's really dense, it's thick, it's, but it's definitely managed. You know, it's not sprawling out across the field but it's also really quite tall. So that's the difference between the, the really heavily managed options and the sort of more lightly managed options that are on the form. So the last one is whether they're getting um, really tall and sort of they're starting to become, um, go down that road of becoming the, the single line of trees. So it's getting a little bit thinner along the bottom because they're really just starting to be trunks rather than, than sort of a, a bushy hedge. Um, so starting to, to spread out on the top. So here we've got, um, is it becoming a little bit thin or is there, is there really very little foliage at the base? So here we've got, it's not quite just a row of trees, um, but it is, is starting to become so. And here this one again, um, it's still quite thick at the base, but it's definitely um, turning into a row of trees. This is probably slightly deceptive because this is a heavy stand of blackthorn, which does um, create a lot of shelter within a hedge. Um, if you have any questions about any of these, um, just pop them in the comments and we'll go through them again later. But I just wanted to give you uh, a bit of an overview of all the different types of hedgerow that we are wanting you to go and look at and survey. So on, a, on an aerial, some of these don't actually look very different from one another, but on the ground, they really, really are very different. So um, coming down from um, what the hedge structure is, um, obviously a hedge has two sides, but not you can't always access both sides. Sometimes one side is on um, private land and you can walk down a footpath on the other side. So if you can only survey one side, that's absolutely still fantastic. Um, we want to hear about, about that. So which side is it? Which side is it facing? And then here, what, what is the, the land use next to it? Which can really help when we're, we're looking at the types of hedge and what's next to it as well. Helps us build up a really good picture um, of, of, of the hedges in the area. Um, how wide is the hedge? Now, what we're asking is for average. So obviously hedges um, might sort of bend and weave a little bit in and out, but on average, how wide is it? And we've got um, some uh, sort of size brackets here. So whether it's a, a rather skinny little hedge um, or something that's a little bit more substantial. And I think the one I showed you that's about as wide as the road was probably in this bracket here, the three to five. And then again, the average height of the hedge. So that's not including the big trees that might stick out because occasionally you do get a, 
a hedge that's got a single tree that pops out. So not including them, just the average height of the actual hedge, hedge bit of it. And then we want to know if there's any of those features that we, we simply wouldn't know about unless you were there. So is there a hedge bank? Um, is there a ditch or any stone facing um, on, on the hedge? Things like um, ditches can be fantastic for amphibians. A lot of our amphibians do actually spend um, most of their, their year away from water. And so having these sort of ditches and damp places is, is really, really great for amphibians. And again, the, the stone facing provides all those nooks and crannies where particularly over winter, um, you might get a whole, whole range of different creatures hibernating within them. So knowing these extra things like that can really tell us um, if a hedgerow is, is maybe a little bit more interesting, maybe might hold a little bit more, um, I don't know, a few more different niches for some of our wildlife and really let us know if that's a, a I hate to say good hedge, but I hope you know what I mean by that. Um, so here, hedgerow trees. So these are those, those trees that do pop up out of a hedgerow. So for these, we'd love to know the species, how tall they are, and the trunk diameter, just to give us a bit of an, an idea of um, their age as well. So again, we've tried to make it easy by giving you height categories, because it can be sometimes really difficult to um, tell how tall a tree is when you're just standing looking at it. Um, and then the trunk diameter is at chest height. Now, you might need to have a little look at your hedge and uh, your tree, because if it's on the top of a big hedge bank, um, at your chest height, you might be almost level with the roots at that point. So really sort of look at about one and a half meters or so um, from, from the base of the tree to see its um, diameter. Here we go, we've got um, a couple of examples of those features. So a classic seven hedge with a hedge bank, um, which um, I don't know the percentage of hedges that are like this, but it seems like a lot of them are in Devon. Um, and here we've got one that's um, it's actually a wall on this side and then a, a bank on the other with um, various trees growing on top. But it seems like this that you do sometimes get on, uh, on hedgerows. Um, so we also want to know about gaps in the hedge. So not all hedgerows are a, a lovely, neat, row from start to finish. Sometimes they can get a bit scruffy. Um, this is between two fields um, where there've been lots of sheep. And I think over many years, they've, they've pushed their way through and created lots of gaps. So what we want to know, as you're walking through um, along your hedge, how big are these gaps? And we're asking you for um, a sort of community, I can't say, add, add up all the gaps. So we've got a figure at the end and we know how much of the overall length of the hedge is gaps. Now gaps are not necessarily a problem um, for a, a healthy hedgerow. Um, if they've got lots of big gaps, then it can be, um, particularly really huge gaps. Um, for example, bats um, in Devon, of which we've got 16 species um, here in the county, they use hedgerows to um, navigate their way around our countryside. So they will fly along a hedgerow to get from A to B. And if there's a huge gap in a hedgerow, that might put off some of our species who really don't like to, to fly out into, into the unknown, um, if it's particularly if it's along, along a, a route that they're used to and a, a gap appears. So knowing what the gaps are in the hedgerow can be really useful to know how how well the hedge is doing. So here we go, collective measure of all the gaps. Um, the average base canopy, that means um, the base canopy is like the lowest bit of the hedge, so of, of the woody growth. So sometimes that might be zero if your hedge extends all the way down to the ground, which is fantastic. So that means that there's um, really great shelter for loads and loads of wildlife in that hedge if, if it can extend down to the ground. And that's something that going back to um, some of the management we saw at the beginning, so laying a hedge every now and again, can really help to keep that um, base canopy low by bending over the sticks, it's um, branches, it stops them from becoming too sort of spindly at the base. Um, so that's a really good way of creating that lovely dense, um, 
dense shelter. Um, so then, of course, we're going to ask you what species are in the hedge. So I'll come to that in a moment. Um, and then whether nettles, cleavers and or docks combined make up more than 20% of the ground flora around the base of the hedge. Now, this might be a bit difficult, particularly at this time of year. Um, but the reason that we're asking about this is that it shows about the nutrient level um, around a hedge. So nettles, cleavers and docks really like to grow on ground that is very, very um, fertile. So maybe it's got um, particularly around sort of pasture um, where there's been animals grazing and um, leaving droppings and really enriching the ground. Um, nettles, cleavers and docks really like that. Um, but it's not always great for some of our other species. So knowing if that makes up 20% can tell us a lot about how the hedge has sort of evolved over time with the, the surrounding land use and how it fits in with that. So we have an optional section, which um, I expect probably won't be filled in very much until the summer, but it's looking at um, other species around um, the hedge. So up to sort of two meters, because the hedge isn't necessarily just that one sort of stretch with all the trees on. It really does encompass space either side of it. So that's all those creatures that might live in the hedge need to forage outside as well. So if there's invertebrates, if there's a lovely wide band of um, wildflowers either side of the hedge, that will provide their, their food source, their nectar, um, the seeds for the small mammals, um, things like that. You know, so a hedge it shouldn't be just thought of as that one strip, but really a sort of slightly wider band either side of it as well. So if you do fancy a bit of a challenge and you'd like to write a species list of what's around the base of the hedge, um, this is your chance here, this section of this form. Oops. And here are some of the things that, that you might find in the summer. Not yet, I'm afraid at the moment, you're going to find um, just lots of small green shoots coming up um, as as things hopefully start to warm up soon. Um, so here we've got some uh, hedge bindweed and some woundwort, um, a bit of uh, red dead nettle here, uh, knapweed, ivy, and our sort of tears and vetches as well. Now ivy you'll find in a hedge, often throughout the hedge. Um, and it, ivy is such a brilliant plant for our wildlife. It flowers really late in the autumn, often into winter, providing a, a really, really much needed at times food source. It keeps its leaves. So if you've got ivy running through the hedge, then even over winter, when there's no leaves on the trees, there'll still be a bit of shelter in there as well. Um, those green leaves providing that for, for a variety of creatures. So if you do fancy a challenge and a bit of um, extra wildflower or plant ID, um, we'd love to hear about it. So when it comes to um, letting us know what species are actually in the hedge, um, these we try to make it easy by giving you a bit of a tick list. So we don't expect you to be to, to necessarily be able to identify everything. Um, so we're asking as well for the, the sort of top five species. So if you're looking along your hedge and you're not quite sure, um, please just let us know kind of the, the ones that you do know and approximately how much there is of it within the, the length of the hedge that you're surveying. We don't need to know that for all the species, just the top five. So you'll see here we've got um, things like ash, which is very common in hedgerows, um, blackthorn, as I've said before, and blackthorn is important for example, for the, the brown hair streak butterfly. Um, got some elder, which I think even when we were doing a, a bit of a survey in January, we saw some of the elder leaves already coming out. Um, hawthorn that was on there, another really, really good um, hedgerow plant and our oaks. And if you don't know exactly which one it is, because particularly, um, well, actually with oats all the way through until they've got some acorns on them, it might be quite difficult to tell one part from the other. So you can just pop oak 
is fine. And then we've got some climbers. So we've got ivy that I've mentioned before and honeysuckle. So again, honeysuckle is a great plant, a fantastic nectar source um, that has quite a, a long and late um, flowering time. The bark as well, um, honeysuckle bark can be quite easily stripped off. And that is something that dormice use to make their nests. So a dormouse nest will be made, a, a breeding nest that is in the summer, will be made of a fantastically woven, often with honeysuckle bark um, ball and then surrounded by green leaves on the outside. And that's how you'd be able to spot a dormouse nest. Or if you do spot one, um, absolutely leave it alone. Dormice are rare and they're protected and um, it's actually um, against the law to, to disturb a dormouse nest. So if you do see one, count yourself very lucky and then leave it alone. There's Traveller's Joy as well, which is a plant that um, it's often, I find actually most obvious in winter or in autumn. Um, I don't know if when you to drive around, I've seen it from um, the dual carriageways, you can, you can spot it as you're flying past because it, after it flowers, um, it produces a sort of really almost fluffy um, seed head. Not fluffy like a dandelion, but sort of just, just really does um, stand out. And that can climb and sprawl over quite large sections of um, vegetation. And so in autumn, that is, that is kind of what you can see that the, the seed heads. So, as I mentioned, um, at this time of year, it can be quite difficult to identify plants. So trees are a good, good place to start for um, identifying plants in winter because, um, well, they're quite big and they don't move very fast and you can really, really get a good look at them. So we do have um, a winter twig ID talk uh, online that you can look at in more detail. But I've chosen a few species here that um, are really different and can really show you um, the, the different things to look at when you're trying to identify trees. So this is beech. And one of the great things about beech is beech nuts hang around for ages. So that can be your first clue. Before you even look at the tree, look around the base and you might be able to see some of the fallen um, nuts and seeds and in this, you know, in the case of beech, usually quite dense and heavy. Um, and around, around the base of beech trees, you often, um, they suppress other growth um, because of these heavy beech nuts falling. And you can see the bud is quite long, thin, very pointed, and it sticks up away from the, the, the twig it's growing on at quite a, quite a great angle. It really, really sticks out and a sort of beautiful, rusty, almost coppery colour. Here we've got hazel and we've got some catkins. They're all out at the moment, looking absolutely amazing. Um, these, these, these catkins are the, the male flower. Um, the female flowers are really, really tiny and bright pink, like really, really gorgeous, like fuchsia pink, um, but they're much, much smaller and they kind of come out from, from the end of, it looks like a bud, and they come out and they're out at the moment as well. So keep an eye out for them because they're really beautiful when you spot them. But this, this hazel twig here um, shows a really good example of how, how different twigs can be. So here the hazel bud is green, often with a little red tinge around the base. You can see the edge of this scale so these are called leaf scales um, as they, they grow on the bud. This is actually a little bit hairy along the edge, as is the twig. Now hazel trees are not hairy when they get a bit older, but some of the new twigs are. Um, and that will slowly get worn off throughout the summer um, and as, as they grow. This is an oak tree. And I always find that you can tell oak trees from their shape. Obviously, if they are part of the hedge, that's not going to help you very much. But if they are coming out from the top of the hedge, because we do often get sometimes really quite large oak trees coming out from, from one of our hedgerows. And when the hedge is trimmed, they just go round um, the oak tree 
and leave that and, and keep going. Now hedges with trees in are fantastic. You know, it gives bats a place to, to whoosh around, um, catching the insects, a bit more shelter and really gives a um, sort of an extra dimension to the hedge. Um, so it's not so uniform. Um, so there's a lovely old oak tree covered in, in lichen. And this is a close up of the end of an oak twig. Now, oaks are quite easy to spot because they have a bunch of buds at the end. So they're, they're this gorgeous rusty color and they've got really nicely defined leaf scales on them. So if you get them all in a, in a bunch, then it's, it's most likely oak. And our last one here, just to be a bit different, is alder. And alder buds, um, so I didn't put a close up in, but their buds are nearly sort of a purple colour. Now you get these in much damper areas. So if you're surveying um, a, a hedge that's, that's near a stream or wetland or it turns into a woodland, you might find some alder around the edge, although not a typical hedgerow plant, um, but you do get them where it gets particularly damp. So winter twig ID is something that will be useful um, probably only for a few more weeks now, actually, because the, the leaves really are starting to come out already. Um, I've certainly seen some on, on my recent walks. Um, but as I said, um, we've got a winter twig talk on YouTube um, that you can find via the Conservation Community's website. Um, when the trees are back to sort of coming into leaf and, and you're not relying on, on the winter twigs so much, um, you can use um, a variety of resources. For example, DWT have a species finder um, where you can look at all the different sorts of trees. Um, and basically online, there are so many fantastic resources as well to help you to identify the different tree species that you're going to find within your hedge. Also for wildflowers, um, there's, there's loads of help out there. Um, so including, again, the species finder on the DWT website. So um, thank you very much. I do hope that you would like to take part in our hedge survey. Um, we have um, uh, another little video, which I think Joe might mention in a moment, um, that you can, can hopefully go and look at soon. Um, but yes, anything that you can help us with is amazing. Um, I know that that form looked quite long, but even if you don't complete everything on there, um, you will really, really help us to build up um, our knowledge of hedges within the conservation communities area or, or outside that if, if you don't live within that area yourself. So please do get in touch if you want to be involved. Um, I think Joe's already sent out some information, um, but if you have any questions, please ask them um, now in the chat um, or do get in touch with me later if something pops into your head following the talk. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jess. That's fantastic. Um, it's great to see it all sort of going through bit by bit um, and to sort of have pictures. That's really helpful to see the pictures um, and discuss those. So thanks. That's great. Um, I did see in the chat there's a few questions. There's one that says, could you just go through the hedge canopy um, section again, because somebody missed that bit. And that, to be honest, when I've done surveys, that is the one thing we all stand and discuss and go, Oh, the hedge canopy, <laughs> we've got a bank and we've got a hedge and where do we measure? So if you could just run through that bit one more time, please. Yeah, so um, if you imagine your hedge and all your sort of little hedgerow trees on there, all the branches that come out. So we're looking at the canopy, um, the, the base canopy. So that is the bottom. So not the top of your hedge, but the bottom of the sort of the green section of your hedge. Now that might be uh, zero centimetres if it's really just touching the ground, um, but sometimes it's, it's higher than that um, because either it's on a hedge bank and maybe it's new and it hasn't stretched out across the hedge bank um, or uh, there's, it's, maybe it's gone too far and it's been undermanaged and the little hedgerow trees are starting to try and grow into big proper trees and the, the base of the canopy is moving up with them. So that's why we need to know that, because it can really tell us about how how the management has been of that hedge 
sort of in, in the past. Now, I know it's difficult because if you've got a big hedge bank, and Joe and I recently went to survey a hedge, and the hedge bank was always oh, about one and a half metres, wasn't it? Even up to two metres at a point, um, because the field was slightly lower. And then there was a footpath on the other side that was um, about a metre higher on the other side of the hedge. So it had a really big difference in, in ground level either side of the hedge. Um, so if in doubt, just measure how far it is until you would hit, hit the first leaves um, when they come out in, in spring. And also tell us how tall the hedge bank is. So that, that, that will know. So um, if in doubt, always just, we've got a comments box, use the comments box to explain um, or use the comments box to um, draw a little figure if you want to, if you, if you want to really make sure that I know what you mean. But generally it's just the, the lowest leaves to the ground, that distance. So Jess, the first question is, what's the best tree to plant as a garden hedge? Blackthorn question mark. Um, blackthorn is great. Um, it's very spiky. Um, it depends what you're going to, um, where, where your hedge is in your garden. Um, but I think that probably the key is variety. So if you're going to be planting a hedge, then I think variety is, is definitely um, the thing to go for. So looking at different species that maybe produce fruit at slightly different times um, or fruit that will stay on the tree. So um, blackthorn, hawthorn um, are really good at because they, they kind of hold on to their berries for quite a long time, um, providing um, food for, for birds and small mammals sort of right up until um, into December sometimes. Um, so they're great, but also um, some of the ones that maybe uh, start fruiting a little bit earlier or um, yeah variety is key I think um, it also depends on how big you want your hedge to to grow um, but yes pick, pick a few species um, and if it's in your garden pick ones that you like as well I would say as long as you've got a variety ones that species that you love <sighs> Yeah, so Janice has asked a similar question. She's got a hawthorn hedge and um, she's saying, can she introduce further species to enrich it? So I think you've answered that question as well. Thanks. Yes, if, if there's space, then um, you can get you know, smaller tree plants and, and, and plug them in. Um, OK, so Dan is saying, um, why isn't flay, flailing <laughs> better regulated um, in terms of hedge protection and preservation? Um, so flailing is only allowed during certain months outside bird nesting season for, for obvious reasons. Um, there's, it's, it's a sort of, it's a really difficult and sometimes, I don't want to say contentious, but um, flailing is, is not necessarily bad all the time. Um, if it's done every year, sometimes that can affect um, the, the amount of um, fruits or, or sort of habitat for um, wildlife, for example, um, brown hair streak, which I'm going to mention again, um, they lay their eggs on um, new growth, so only one, two years old. So if you flailed a blackthorn hedge where you've got brown hair streaks every year, you'd probably cut off the eggs each year and those eggs would be lost. Um, so it is regulated to a certain extent. Um, some of it obviously along roads is for safety, um, but things that what um, we would generally recommend is to have um, a system in place where maybe you cut only some of your hedgerows one year and you leave the rest and then you cut another section the next year and you cut another section the next year and then you might start again and do it on a rotation. Um, but that is, that's something that takes some planning. Um, so it's, you, you know, you need to have people who are willing to do that. Um, and that would help to provide habitat and take less time as well um, is a bonus. But in terms of um, preservation orders, I, I, I don't know the details of that, I'm afraid. Thanks, Jess. Um, so um, also Dan said when you were talking about the gaps in the hedge, they're called sheep creeps, which I thought <laughs> was really lovely. <laughs> um, so yeah, now we've got a technical name for them. <laughs> Fantastic. That's exactly what they were doing as well. <laughs> I grew up near that hedge. <laughs> Um, so there's a question about height and banks. 
So do you include the hedge bank and the height of the hedge when you're doing the hedge height on the survey form? Yeah, so we, we discussed this and um, it's really difficult, isn't it? Because uh, yes, there's a bank, but if the trees are on the bank, then um, the height of the hedge might be three metres, but the height of the actual hedge plants might only be one, one and a half metres or so. So I think that where on the form it says, is there a hedge bank? If you say yes, um, then estimate it sort of average height across across your hedge. Um, so sometimes it might it might disappear, sometimes it might come up, um, but give us a, a sort of average height um, of the hedge bank as well as the height of the hedge. And if you're measuring it from the ground up to the top, just pop a little note in the side. Um, I go through all the all the forms. Um, so if you write any comments in there to, to sort of clarify what you're doing, um, I will read them and I will I will know. Um, so that's it can be really difficult um, to estimate. So so normally you might go from the, the roots of the hedge up to the top. But as you said, you know, hedge is not not just the plants on top of it. It's the whole thing. So knowing from from the ground up to the top and knowing the height of the, the bank is really useful. Great, thanks. Uh, we've got another question about size and sort of diameter. There's um, suggestion of if, there's, if the hedgerow is several kilometres long, um, do they do one survey and do a sort of a, a sample piece of that, or do they um, do multiple surveys? So a hedgerow um, is usually from, if you imagine a network of fields, um, and you might have a hedger does this and it meets another hedge going that way, that point there would be the start of the hedge, and you'd go along until there's another junction. Um, and even if that's sort of a, a T junction on, on your hedge, so your hedge sort of continues, but there's another one, that's a, that's a good place to stop. Um, so it gives you, that generally reduces the size of your hedge, so you're not going to be walking for miles and miles with one hedge. Um, you're going to be having, you know, maybe, maybe a few hundred metres long, maybe just a hundred metres long, maybe even less than that. Um, it doesn't really matter how long the hedge is that you, you choose to survey. Um, choose one that you've got access to, um, that maybe is along your normal dog walking route or something. And um, then you can base it out and just fill in the form as you go. It shouldn't take too long to do. And um, once you've sort of ID'd some of the, the species within it, um, hopefully you can do it as you sort of just go out for a walk. And there's a little question about um, cleavers. Um, could you just clarify that that is goose grass? It is goose grass, yes. Cleavers is the official form, um, official name, but there's, there's a, a, about a million names for that, that uh, are associated with that plant. Um, and then another survey question is for those who are living outside of the project area, which is quite a few mm -hmm. people tonight, um, is there um, benefits of them doing a hedge survey? And if so, um, are there any particular types of hedge that would be better for them to survey for you? So uh, firstly, yes, please do survey. Um, we'd love that. So we're focusing on the conservation communities area purely because um, we're using you as guinea pigs um, to see if we can um, uh, launch this survey, but we would love to do it in other places as well. Um, and as I think I said in answering the previous question, do just go for a hedge that, that you've got access to, that you walk past. You don't need to go out and, and look for a certain type of hedge. Um, it's sort of all, all hedges around um, will just help us to, to build up a picture. Obviously, we're not going to cover an entire equator's worth of, of hedgerows through Devon, but if we can pick some um, sort of just even across the county, that would be great. Um, and there's a question here that says, um, is it possible to explain in simple terms um, what is an important hedge in terms of the law um, which could be protected? Um, so there are the hedgerow regulations, which I think are 1997, um, uh, or Hedgerow Regulation Act, and that describes um, what's, what is an important hedgerow. So usually that means that it's got um, it's species rich, um, but it's, a, it's almost like a formula that you add together. So it's how many different woody species. So those are the tree species that we've been asking you to look at. Um, and then you get points for if it's got a hedge bank or a ditch or a wall or some of the features as well. And also some of the sort of rarer ground flora too, along with its um, age 
and, and various other details. So it's, um, there are a number of different criteria for it, um, but that is, the, that is the sort of original act, um, Hedgerows Act um, 1997, I think, that, that describes what an important hedgerow is. Um, but that's it, it's, it's looking if it's an old hedge, um, which usually if it's got multiple species in it, um, it does give a sort of a bit of an indication of how old it is. So that's why we look at the number of species, unless it's just literally being planted, but you can hopefully tell that. <laughs> Thanks, Jess. Um, and there's a question here. There's several comments from people um, who have said that they'll have a go at doing a survey and um, some people have said what species they've got in hedges near them, which is great. Um, and then there's a question that says, um, going back to the flailing management mm -hmm. kind of um, questions, um, is there a way to discuss this, um, the management with the local authorities and the farmers who manage the hedges? You know, can we make some progress and change the way these are managed? Um, jo, you might know a little bit more than me about Devon Wildlife Trust. Um, I know they have various people within the staff who are specific, so farm advisors who go, but they, they're generally work within certain areas I believe yeah that's there would be information there are there are people in the organization who do farm advice and they would um, definitely include hedgerow management within that farm advice I think hedgerows are becoming um, more of a highlight in the next few years with the the latest sort of funding that's coming through for landowners and farming mm. And I think there's going to be a, a big encouragement for farmers not to cut every year. So that would mean flailing every other or every third year. Um, how long it takes for that to come through and for farmers to take that offer up. Um, obviously, all roadside edges would have to be done every year, certainly on, on corners and, and narrow roads. Um, but I think the idea is that we do start leaving some of the hedges slightly longer. Not, not so long that they become straggly and gappy, um, but so that they are, are trimmed less, less frequently and on a rotation. I think that's the idea. So it'll be a case of waiting and seeing, but definitely bring it up with landowners that you know or councils, if the councils are responsible for cutting hedges, because the notion to date will be to keep things tidy and manicured. And that, as we know, and, that, and moving away from that, it's better for wildlife. Um, if they're if they're slightly less manicured so yeah let's let's watch this space on that one um i think one more question has just popped in okay um when a hedge is tall trees what's the best way to improve it for wildlife um i think sometimes that can depend on where that hedge is um you could plant a few more trees um beneath it although that can be quite difficult when it's sort of a mass of roots um Sometimes, um, depends on how old the trees are, I think. When they're in the really big mature trees, then it's fantastic just to leave them as mature trees. Um, if they're starting to get a bit, bit leggy, um, you could talk to someone who does um, hedge laying and seeing if it's too late to, to lay the hedge or not. Um, think, but otherwise, sometimes you just need to embrace trees. Yeah. I think some hedges that are sort of 30 years old and the trees are getting quite large, they would then perhaps coppice the big ones. Yeah, coppice them as well. the regrowth and then lay the regrowth. Yeah. I think that's quite a, quite a popular way of managing that situation and bringing a hedge back into good condition. Mm. Um, obviously, you can't lay huge, great big trees, but you can certainly, when they, when they regrow and the coppicing works, you can lay that then in a few years' time. So I think that's one of the management techniques for that. So um, Jess, just to say thank you again. And yes, uh, any, any wildlife data that you do have, do send it into DBRC. Um, we love getting wildlife records. That's what we're here for. So whether you're in the conservation communities area or elsewhere, do, do send Devon Biodiversity Record Centre your, your records. Thank you.